to our hopper controls. One of the pain points of the old machine that customers told us, you know, they were constantly replacing cables when it came to the controls for the hopper. So we tasked the engineers with, okay, come up with a better cable so, you know, it, it, you don't have to grease it all the time and all that kind of stuff. Engineers came back to me and said, hey, we have the perfect solution. We're just going to get rid of all the cables. So you'll notice all of your hopper controls are all solid linkages so you don't have to worry about your cables seizing up or having to add like a, a three-in-one oil to to have them function smoothly that's all been eliminated with these uh the solid linkages here can you show me one more time how, how you raise that thing yep. up row, lower and raise because i want to understand that yep uh so we'll go ahead and put this down So when it comes time and you want to flip the hopper up, there's this black little lever here that is spring loaded. So okay. what you're going to want to do is squeeze on that and then pull up. And then this hopper flips forward and there's a prop rod here that holds it in place when it's, it's flipped forward. When it comes time to put the hopper down, you'll see there's this detent here okay. so that when it gets to that point on the frame, it stops until you lift it up. Okay. And that's just to ensure that, you know, if somebody pushes the hopper, it doesn't come slamming down, uh, things of that nature. So if we push the hopper forward, um, what you'll notice again is you'll see, you'll see how the, the hopper stops there. And then to get it all the way down, all you need to do is lift up a little bit on that prop rod, and then it sits oh, down, gotcha. and you can hear it click it. Yeah, I got you. And that's mostly for maintenance, or would you do that on like a daily basis to like blow it out? I mean, is that, I know obviously when you're changing oil and that sort of stuff, but is that, you would raise that up and blow all the fertilizer out and stuff yep, like that? Yep, that's definitely one thing I, I personally would do, because uh, it gives you good access to, you yeah. know, any of the areas where fertilizer might have been caught up on the frame to, to blow that off, as well as just a real easy way to clean your yeah. hopper out. I know when I picked the machine up, that was one thing my dealer mentioned. He brought, he said, this is one thing I love, and he lifted it up, and he's like, he sell out the, they were a little bit inconvenient to get to the uh, maintenance on the older models. Most definitely, yeah. most definitely. So one of the things you would have noticed was when I was putting it down, um, it, was, it was hitting this uh, line right here yeah. so this is just for the foam marker so what we'll do is we will kind of reroute this okay. um, so that it's it's nice and tight yeah, here on the frame so that when this goes down it's not hitting yeah, anything so Ben when it comes to the controls for for the hopper all of the controls have been moved to the operator station so to set your rate dial that's now up here uh, where the white dot is is where you're at so obviously you have from one to nine to make the adjustment for your rate. This right here is to open and close the gate. This is gonna be your side deflector. So if you're going by a sidewalk, driveway, or fence line, you'd go ahead and, and push that yeah. down. Um, and then right here is your adjustment, uh, your pattern adjust. So if okay. you're throwing heavy to the left or to the right, you can make that adjustment mm -hmm. here. Um, and what we've done on this adjustment is we've, we've made it a thread. So you have really, really, really precise control mm -hmm. of, of your, your spread pattern. And you'll also notice down there, there's a cotter pin that's by a decal that has, you know, A through G on it. As you're doing your application, let's say, you know, your summer application, you know it needs to be at, let's say, D. The following year, when you're putting down that same application, it's gonna be really, really easy to figure out where you're, you need to be to get your even spread for that particular product. Yeah, I need to get better at making notes like that, just knowing exactly where to dial it in on a certain product. Yep. Because I'm new to the, uh, the larger Z spray models here, but is it, I know the, we're gonna talk about speed and driving it later, and we are gonna drive it, but th is it kind of standard practice that you would set this to keep it at a steady miles per hour so that you would know you're consistent? I mean, is that what these dials are for? Yep, so what these dials do, it, it allows you to loosen this, this front reference bar right here. So what you do oh, okay. is, you know, let's say first thing in the morning, you 
you know, go on the driveway and, and kind of figure out, okay, right here is where I'm at five miles okay. an hour. And you'd lock that in. This way you know, hey, when I'm on a lawn, all I need to do is squeeze the sticks and I'm at five miles an hour. This way you're not having to, to constantly watch your speed. As guys become more familiar with the equipment, they probably aren't adjusting the front reference bar because they have a, a feeling for what five miles an hour is. It's definitely a great tool uh, for any operator, specifically those that are, are new. Um, it's one less thing that they're having to monitor while they're applying fertilizer or weed control they know just squeeze the sticks and what would be a kind of a people running out and typically as far as speed goes so uh, typically with the old units it was somewhere between four and five miles an hour depending on what your application rate was what we've found with our new units is because we've improved the overall ride comfort of these units guys are actually able to put down their applications between five and six miles an hour as opposed to four to five which does doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, when you're on a couple hundred lawns a year, it, it really adds up. Yeah, I drove the other day, it's fast. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think I need to go that fast. <laughs> no, and really the the main reason why we have such a, a fast top end speed is transport. Yeah, because right? yeah, so these, these, these are not that. So, I don't know what these are in, in comparison. But, yeah, so that you know, one if is you're, if about you're eight. That, okay, yeah, this one is going to be at about 10. So, okay. Ben, do you, do you use the the stop there to keep you at a set speed or you just kind of got a feel this, for it? kind of like Jonathan was just saying, I, I once I kind of got more of a feel for the machine, I, I quit using that speed bar. I just leave it all the way up. And if I need to transport the machine across a, a you know, an open area, not making an application, I can just hold it wide open and get where I need to go. And then when I go back to applying the chemicals, I just kind of have a feel for it. So as far as the spray system goes, there have been a couple of, of changes and updates. First, when it comes to your overall manifold, your spray manifold here. So, you know, this controls your left boom, center and right. This black uh, lever here is actually what controls your hose reel. So it's no longer a, a ball valve off of one of the valves. It has its own independent valve and is obviously a different color. So operators know it's your hose reel versus your spray boom. The other thing that's different in comparison to the way the valves work, on the old machines, Ben, you probably know when the valves are down, they're on. When they're up, they're off. This is the opposite. It's a change that the T-Jet, who's the manufacturer of the, the old valves as well as the new ones, a change they made. So down is off, up is on. Still have your regulator here, which obviously adjusts your pressure, and then you have a pressure gauge right here in the console to see where your pressure's at. Is there a recommended setting I need to try to keep the pressure at? Yeah, so again, it's all dependent on how fast you want to be going and what your, you know, your application rate needs to be. Typically, guys are setting it around 40 PSI. Okay. With our standard nozzles, 40 PSI at five miles an hour, that's 14.9 gallons per acre that you'd be putting down. Okay. Um, so if you look at Ben's unit, you'll see that the, the valves in the pump are mounted to the the top of the right tank. Um, again, with doing VOC or voice a customer when we were working on the redesign, um, customers weren't necessarily thrilled with the placement of those valves because they'd say they'd go along a tree line or something and a, a branch might snag one of those valves and inadvertently turn it off and they wouldn't know till you know, the next time they looked at it, which could be, you know, two seconds later or two hours later. So we went ahead and re relocated those valves so that they're right kind of at your knee level. Um, so you have your return and your suction for the, for the right tank and your return and your suction for the left tank. All right, so talk, talk to me about like, how do you, I just wanted to spray. So yep. like, how do I set those? So the other nice thing that we've done, and it, this is gonna be a roundabout way to answering your question, but it's good information to know. Um, we went ahead and we relocated the pump from being on top of the tank okay. to down low in between the tanks. So there's a couple of benefits we get from that. Uh, first and foremost, when the, the pump is above the tanks, it has to work hard when you first turn that pump on because you're obviously fighting gravity, right? So there's a little bit of priming that happens and that's what would lead to, let's say, premature failures on a pump. With it being down low in between the tanks, gravity is naturally priming that pump so it's never really having to do heavy lifting as far as having to, to suck liquid up you know let's say a foot or two 
The other nice thing about having it in between the two tanks is that it equally draws the tanks down. Ben, you probably noticed that when, if you're using yeah. both tanks, your right tank empties a little bit quicker yeah. than your left tank. Yeah. And that's, that's because the pump is on the, the right tank versus the left. Uh, so that's that's another one of the benefits there. So you, it's naturally it's the way it's, uh, it's going to pull from both at the same time, but you can set it to pull from one or it, the other. Exactly. So the way that this is right now, um, these valves are all in the off position. So having them this way or in line is what turns them on. Um, this also gives you the ability, let's say, if you wanted to move product from your right tank to your left tank, you would just close your return on the right tank and then you would close the suction on the left tank and that would allow you to transfer product from the right tank to the left tank or vice versa and you'd have to obviously uh, make those respective changes to, to the suction and return lines. So it is possible like we have multiple grass types that you could run one product on one side and one on the other side. Most definitely as long as they're both lawn safe products and compatible with one another uh, because obviously when you let's say you switch from the left to the right or right yeah. to the left you're still going to have whatever is in you know yeah. the line going down to the boom. Um, and then it'll spray through. Yeah. What about these pedals that are here on the platform? I see two pedals. Can you explain those? Yep. So the, the pedal that's over on the left hand side, that's our uh, spot spray switch. Um, so let's say you're putting a weed control down and fertilizer as you're going over those weeds. You don't want to blanket spray the entire lawn, just spot spray. You can just step on that toe switch and it'll turn your spray system on, let off. Obviously, it turns it off. Um, the pedal that's over here on the right side is for the locking casters. Um, again, that was something that was a cable system before on the old units um, and didn't have the, the durability that, you know, we've come to expect from machines. So we went ahead and also changed that to solid linkages. Um, so you're not having to worry about the cable freezing up or having to put three in one on it to, to keep it moving and working correctly. So I've, I've heard about the locking caster, but I'm not exactly sure I know what that is. Is that, that I, I know it's something to have to do with like hill stability and things like that. Yep. So not only hill stability, but also let's say you're on a little bit of a softer lawn and you've gone into an area where you need to back up. So with typical front casters, what will happen is those casters will spin around and as they're spinning around, they have a tendency to tear the turf if it's in a, a soft area. So if you put those locking casters on it, it keeps them in line, but it also reduces that turf tearing as you're, as you're backing up. Uh, but like you said, yes, the, the locking casters help with hillside stability because you're locking your casters together as opposed to if you weren't locking them, they would have a tendency to start to droop down. And that's when, you know, as soon as those front wheels start to droop down, the rest of the machine is going down with it. So it helps, you know, kind of maintaining, you know, whatever your, your path is on a hill. And so that's, would that primarily be for going uh, sideways across a hill instead of up and down on That is correct. And if you, but when you get to the end of that pass, you want to turn around. Do you unlock them or you leave them locked? Nope, you would want to unlock them. Okay, and then uh, when you get going straight again, lock them back. Correct. Okay. And the other times that we see guys using it is, let's say there's a huge wide open field. Um, and from one end to the other is like, let's say a quarter mile or something like that. Um, guys will go ahead and use those locking casters to kind of help keep them in a straight line without constantly having to, to make adjustments um, but again you know it's there's various uses for the locking caster depending on what kind of properties you're on and, and your overall comfortability with the machine so when it comes to operator comfort made a couple of changes one being here to the pad we've added a little bit more bolstering to the side so as you're you know on a hill or something like that you can kind of lean into the machine we've also made it longer uh, than the old one and we've improved how the the operator pad actually attaches to the machine so you'll see we have these two little ears right here and it's actually magnetic uh, as opposed to Velcro, uh, how it used to be. And again, talking with customers, they would say, well, after the first couple of hours of use, that fertilizer dust would get in the Velcro and it stopped working. Uh, so magnets keep it nice and sturdy there. So when you pull this up and off, 
Um, you have access, obviously, to your fuel tank. We have a five-gallon fuel tank with a gauge on it. Um, that's a big change from the old style where the fuel tank was up high. Um, it's down nice and low. And then on the back of our operator pad, um, we have our uh, rate chart. So what comes standard on these machines are lavender tips. Um, and what this is showing you is that if you're at 40 PSI and you're going five miles an hour, you're gonna be putting down 14.9 gallons per acre or 0.34 gallons per thousand. If you um, want some new tips, you just go to your dealer and get new tips. That is correct. And you'll see here, you know, with these various colors, we have the corresponding part numbers. Um, so depending on what you your rate needs to be, you might be able to get away with using the standard tips by just adjusting your pressure or your speed. But if you're out of that range between 13.1 and 18.4, then you're probably going to need to change to a different tip size. A parking brake on your old unit. Does it do a really good job of holding the unit in place? Uh, there was probably a little room for improvement on the parking brake. <laughs> it's not terrible, but it's not great either. So that was another big change that we made. Um, as opposed to having a separate pump and wheel motor, we have uh, transaxles in here and they're Hydrogear 5400s. One of the big, big benefits that we get out of it, in, a, in addition to you know fewer leak points and things of that nature, is a parking brake that'll actually hold the machine. So what it does when you engage this park brake is there's a, a wet disc that's inside the, the gear set in there and actually locks the gears out from moving. So. If you put your park brake on on this unit, we can really, we could move it by hand, right? When you have the park brake on on this unit, the only way you're gonna be moving the unit is if the tires are actually dragging along, you know, the, the concrete or lawn that you're on, because those wheels will not turn. Uh, let me ask you a yep. question. Uh, one thing I was noticing on Ben's machine versus uh, my new machine is the his tank has a, a separate pump on it and everything his own one and then mine is kind of filtered through the main spray system so you explain the difference in those yep so what ben has on his unit right now is an isolated tank so the way i like to think about an isolated tank is it's isolated from the rest of the machine so if you had a high dollar product that you didn't want to mix up you know in this machine 15 gallons of you could do it separately in here or if you have a you know a, a total kill product um, like a roundup you could put it in here without putting or contaminating the rest of your system now if we look at the auxiliary tank that's on your unit here um, that gets plumbed through the rest of the system so essentially what you're doing is you're expanding your total capacity um, and that's another one of the differences between these two machines is the liquid capacity. Ben's unit has two 15 gallon tanks for 30 gallons of liquid. We have two 20 gallon tanks for, for 40 gallons. So uh, your mid unit has 10 additional gallons compared to the old one. And I noticed the lower center of gravity on the yep. tank, how that one, you know. That is correct. I mean, that's about your extra five gallons, but y'all put it low, which I'm assuming helps with like. With your stability. Yeah. And you'll see we have it right over the front of the drive wheels. So it, it helps with stability and traction. Another thing you'll notice on the tanks is we actually have these graduation marks molded into the tank, as opposed to this right here, which is a decal, which can wear out over time. So that's a nice feature to add. The other thing that we've done with these tanks is we've added a valve on the suction side so that if you want to drain your tanks, you just pull and twist the valve and you'll completely drain out your tanks. No tools required, nothing like that. Just a, a simple pull and twist of a valve down there and you'll completely drain out your tanks. A couple other changes that we made to help improve operator comfort. One of them is a larger tire size. So these are 24 12 12s. We get two main benefits from that. One, we increase our ground speed from about eight miles an hour to 10 miles an hour. And this gives an overall better ride comfort because you have that larger tire. Um, another change we made for operator comfort is on the platform itself. So if we look underneath the platform, you'll see those rubber isolators that are there. Um, and that's a difference. The old unit had just springs on them. These isolators can be moved either forwards for a softer ride or rearwards for a stiffer ride, depending on the operator's preference. I can tell the, the actual uh, platform the itself, platform itself yeah. is, is bigger than and that. We've, we've changed so that we know that this grip tape here kind of loses its grippiness yeah. over time. Uh, whereas kind of this punched out star pattern we have yeah. provides you grip regardless. How do you, when y'all say um, 
user feedback or however you word it. like how do you do y'all think of most of this or like how do you take notes or do you literally send out a survey or y'all go around interviewing people or what how do you come up with the data to like change something like that because i don't know that i would have thought of that yep so it's a combination of a lot of things we'll go out you know when we started this project it was right around uh late fall of 2019 uh, so we went around to users during their off season, kind of talked to them about what they liked about the machine, what they didn't like about the machine. Uh, and then as we got into that 2020 season, uh, we would just go out and we would just watch operators, uh, see how they're interacting with the machine and seeing if we could, you know, do anything to improve what I like to call uh, economy of motion, right? You know, what can we do to eliminate a movement here, a movement there, a couple seconds here, a couple seconds there. You know, Jason, like you were saying, it's it's a matter of we'll send out surveys, we'll talk to customers, we'll talk to dealers. Um, and it's important to talk to dealers and customers that are across the country, right? Because how you use the machine is going to be vastly different than how somebody in, let's say, New England does, or somebody on the Pacific Northwest, or down south in Texas or Florida. So you have to make sure you're getting as much feedback as possible so that the machine isn't just geared towards one specific person or region. It's able to accommodate the needs of customers across the country. Yeah, like Ben was saying for the warm season turf, you know, the, the foam marking thing is, is almost not, you know, 100% mandatory, but it certainly helps. But when you have cool season grass, it's so much easier to see your tire tracks than for us. Sometimes you just can't see them. Exactly. And I mean, same with like Florida, right? You know, you really can't see your tire tracks. And even for those cool season grasses, I highly recommend the foam markers because uh, it, it obviously helps you, you know, make sure you're applying the product uh, evenly across the lawn. But it also is a good proof of service uh, for the customers if they can, you know, see all of those foam, you know, on their lawn as you're applying. They know, hey, look, I, I'm getting my money's worth. This guy's actually applying it all over my lawn because I see those foam dots all over the place. All right, hopefully you learned all the details you need to know about the Z-Spray, the old model, the new model, the changes being made, but I personally am ready to ride it and stop talking about it as much. So we're going to do uh, some more videos, ride it. We even got some drone footage. So I'm going to probably just make a series on YouTube here so you can um, watch all the Z-Spray material you want. So let's get started riding the machine. <laughs>